Good morning. I'm Cheryl Neely. Welcome to the Foreign Press Center's video conference briefing with Dr. George Diaz of, on remdesivir as a treatment for COVID-19. The meeting host will now mute all journalists' microphones. Please keep your microphone muted until you are called on um, to ask a question. <clears throat> you may record the briefing by clicking on the record button on the menu at the bottom of the Zoom screen. The meeting host will now mute all journalists' microphones, please. I'm going to unmute Dr. Diaz. Okay, we're hearing a lot of noise. Carlos, will you please mute the microphones? Okay, thank you. And we need to unmute Dr. Diaz again. Please pardon the interruption. Carlos, can you unmute Dr. Diaz? Okay, continuing on, if the Zoom session fails or disconnects, um, everyone please go back to the link and click on it to join again. If you have technical problems during the briefing, you can use the chat feature to, email, to uh, chat with Bryce, my colleague, or the meeting host, and they will try to assist you. The ground rules for this briefing are is that the briefing is on the record. Non-governmental guests invited to address FPC member journalists offer their views in a personal or organizational capacity and do not represent the official views of the Foreign Press Center or the US government. So I'd like to introduce our briefer today, Dr. George Diaz. And first, Dr. Diaz, I'd really like to thank you for your time today, for being with us, and thank you as one of the very first first responders in the U.S. Um, for this pandemic. We really appreciate um, everything you do. Uh, Dr. Diaz is Section Chief of Infectious Diseases at Providence Regional Med Medical Center in Everett in the state of Washington. Dr. Diaz is currently investigating the use of remdesivir in a clinical trial and his experience using remdesivir on US patient one was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Dr. Diaz is a leading expert on the treatment of COVID-19 and he will provide a brief overview of his experience treating the novel coronavirus and his partnership with the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention which as you all know, we call the CDC. Um, his experience with working with them to treat the first confirmed US patient. Then we will take questions and answers. And as you all know, the US Food and Drug Administration just approved the use of remdesivir to treat COVID-19 patients under emergency use regulations while global clinical trials continue. Um, at the end of the briefing, after we complete the English portion of the briefing, we will stay on um, those who want to, to participate in a Spanish language dialogue with Dr. Diaz. And with that, I will let the doctor give a brief opening statement, and then I will come back to open the question and answer session. Dr. Thank Diaz. You. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the US State Department uh, and the collaboration with CDC uh, uh, that we've had uh, throughout this entire time that we've had the uh, uh, pandemic in the U.S. Uh, our uh, story uh, in Everett began uh, in uh, on January 20th. Uh, at that point, uh, we had uh, the first uh, confirmed patient with uh, COVID-19 uh, in our county. Uh, we immediately were contacted by the CDC who uh, recommended that we admit the patient for observation to our hospital. Uh, while he was admitted to the hospital, uh, he initially had uh, symptoms typical of COVID-19 with fever, uh, cough, uh, and generalized fatigue. Uh, he intermittently had diarrhea as well. Uh, a few days into his illness, the patient developed pneumonia. Uh, he developed shortness of breath, uh, and he developed low oxygen levels uh, when we checked his oxygen levels uh, on a pulse oximetry. Uh, because of these findings, we suspected that he had progressed to uh, pneumonia secondary to COVID. Uh, and at that point, uh, with the CDC expertise on hand, uh, 
they suggest that we consider the use of remdesivir. Uh, we had recently gotten reports out of China that a large number of patients uh, progressed to uh, severe pneumonia as well as a need for uh, care in the intensive unit, intensive care unit. Uh, because of this, we reviewed uh, this data from China. Uh, with the patient as well as uh, the use of remdesivir. Uh, it had not yet been previously used in patients uh, with COVID-19, however, uh, had been tested in um, healthy volunteers uh, during the uh, Ebola outbreak. Uh, at that time, the drug appeared to be safe, but unfortunately was not very active against the Ebola virus disease. Uh, so we could at least provide to the patient uh, some safety data regarding the medication. Uh, in addition, there had been uh, relatively recently released studies looking at the use of remdesivir in animal models, uh, and it appeared to uh, reduce the effect of the virus uh, in the lung in, in these animals. Uh, for these reasons, the patients uh, agreed to receive uh, remdesivir, uh, and uh, Gilead, uh, the manufacturer, and the FDA were able to provide it to us uh, with under compassionate use. Uh, because of the, the proximity of Gilead to Seattle, we were able to receive the drug and begin infusing uh, the medication within 24 hours. Uh, before infusion, the patient had been having uh, high-grade fevers uh, and uh, low oxygen levels, uh, and uh, we infused it uh, that day. Uh, he did not have any symptoms from the infusion itself. Uh, and by the next day, uh, the patient felt much better overall. Uh, his fevers uh, significantly improved and in the patient stayed a fever all the rest of the time he was in the hospital. Uh, he did not have any ill effects from the antiviral, uh, and he was able to come off oxygen within about 24 hours. Uh, within about uh, five days of the first dose, he was able to uh, discharge at home, uh, and he was sent home on home quarantine with um, under the care of the, the county health department. Uh, and uh, since then, he's done quite well and uh, has had no apparent sequelae from the infection uh, after discharge. Uh, after uh, the patient uh, went home, uh, we began seeing uh, larger numbers of patients within uh, our county and our area, which is Western Washington. Uh, and over the next few weeks, uh, began uh, adding patients uh, to a treatment uh, through the Compassionate Use Program uh, with Gilead. Uh, and then after a few weeks in early March, uh, Gilead uh, was able to help us stand up a clinical trial here in our area uh, at both Providence and Swedish Medical Center uh, for treatment of patients with severe pneumonia. Uh, we uh, have been uh, treating patients who present with uh, a pneumonia on x-ray, uh, low oxygen levels, uh, less than 94%, uh, and a, a positive uh, COVID test. Uh, we uh, have enrolled quite a few patients since the, the volume of patients in our area has, uh, has had significantly increased as we were one of the first epicenters of the pandemic in the U.S. Um, on treatment with remdesivir, uh, we have um, we have seen uh, little in the way of substantial side effects from treating large numbers of patients. Uh, the the primary symptom really is nausea occurring in, in less than 10% of patients. Uh, there are some exclusion criteria for use of the drug, uh, and that's limited our ability to give some patients uh, this medication. And th the primary reason for not providing this medication has been due to uh, uh, abnormally low uh, kidney function. Uh, otherwise, we have uh, primarily been using it in patients who have uh, COVID pneumonia. Uh, after the first uh, 400 patients were enrolled, uh, the company uh, added uh, the option to use uh, remdesivir in patients on the ventilator. Uh, prior to that, we weren't able to enroll patients who uh, were already on the ventilator when, uh, when we received them for care. Um, in the past um, uh, week or so, uh, there has been some data that's come out uh, from the NIH uh, on their trial, uh, which has uh, indicated the, um, that the uh, recovery time uh, for COVID-19 patients is, is reduced uh, by roughly four days. Uh, uh, they, they may also be seeing a mortality benefit, although that's not yet been published, uh, and that they're undergoing further analysis uh, of their patients to make that determination. Uh, 
Uh, in addition, the, the Gilead, uh, the manufacturer of remdesivir, also last week uh, announced uh, some top line results uh, from their uh, pneumonia trial, which indicated that uh, five days of therapy of, with remdesivir pneumonia appears to be equivalent to 10 days of uh, remdesivir uh, in pneumonia. They also added additional um, data as well in their press release that indicated that patients who received remdesivir early, uh, meaning during the first 10 days of symptoms, uh, were more likely to uh, discharge the hospital than those that were started uh, after 10 days of symptoms had elapsed. Uh, the difference in, in the ability to discharge from the hospital uh, was measured at 13%. Uh, given these findings, uh, the uh, FDA uh, has granted uh, emergency use authorization for the use of remdesivir uh, in patients with uh, severe pneumonia. Great. Is that at the end of your opening? Yes. Statement? Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Diaz. Um, Dr. Diaz, we do have one request from a TV station that during the question and answer period, you look at directly at the camera. It's uh, better for them. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, and so we will start the question and answer period. Um, to ask a question, again, please click on the raise hand button at the bottom of the participant list. If you don't know where that is, open the participant tab in Zoom. The link is at the bottom. Uh, click on participants and it will open a screen usually to the right. Click on the raised hand button and I will call on you one in one. Um, please make sure that your name and outlet show in the participant list. I will prioritize calling on those who have identified themselves. Um, if you have called in by telephone, um, we will try to give an opportunity at the end to ask a, a question, but it's better if you use the link and log in um, on the website or the app. Okay, so with that, um, we like will take, yes. I, I'd like to add one more statement from, sure. from uh, my brief. So uh, my hospital uh, belongs to a, a large health system, uh, Providence St. Joseph Health. Uh, we have uh, 51 hospitals on the West Coast. Uh, the area that's been uh, most rapidly hit by uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, since uh, we had a number of hospitals participating in these clinical trials with, with remdesivir, uh, we've been conducting a retrospective review of our patients uh, admitted to our hospitals with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we have uh, very preliminary results, but we also appear to be seeing uh, a mortality benefit with uh, remdesivir use as compared to standard care therapy. Uh, so those results are early, uh, but very promising, uh, and we are awaiting a peer review before uh, discussing uh, further data. Thank you. And for clarification, did you say mortality benefit? Yes. Could you define that for our journalists? Yeah. So uh, we appear to be seeing that patients that receive uh, remdesivir uh, appear to have a, a, an improved or reduced mortality uh, compared to those patients that do not receive uh, remdesivir. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, I will begin now um, calling on journalists. And uh, just to remind everyone, we'll have an English portion of the briefing that will last for a while, and then we will end the English portion and we will have a, an availability for um, those from Spanish language outlets to ask questions in Spanish. Um, so if I will call first on Nikila Natarajan from the Indo-Asian News Service. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dias. Uh, I'm Nikila from Indo-Asian News Service, and I also work with a think tank called Observer Research Foundation, uh, both headquartered in India. I live and work in the US. Two things that you said stood out to me. You said that within the first 24 hours of remdesivir, you noticed significant changes I'd like you to hold that thought and tell me exactly what kind of changes you saw, which made you feel that this is a significant improvement, material improvement. The second point you said is about giving it early. Now, that's a theme we've been noticing uh, across um, doctors' chatter, even on social media, about giving it early and doing those randomized control trials. So I want you to just... Um, Elaborate on both these pieces. 24 hours, what were those changes? 
And what does giving it early mean? At what point do you say this is early enough? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, with respect to the, the findings in our patients uh, that made us feel that he was improving, uh, he had uh, his fevers entirely resolved. So he no longer had fevers uh, during the admission. Uh, prior to treatment with remdesivir, he was having fevers as high as 103 degrees Fahrenheit, 39 degrees Celsius. Uh, thereafter, his temperatures remained roughly uh, 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, he was also able to come off of oxygen, so he no longer needed oxygen supplementation uh, to main saturate, maintain his saturations above 94%. Uh, in addition, he generally felt much better, uh, like he was uh, resolving the infection, uh, and he no longer felt shorter breath. Uh, those were the three sort of features that we saw that, that made us feel that he was improving. Uh, with respect to early treatment, um, with the uh, clinical trial that we've been involved in, the inclusion criteria uh, is uh, the presence of a, a, a pneumonia on x-ray, uh, the uh, positive uh, COVID result, um, and also uh, the finding of hypoxemia, uh, meaning a saturation of 94% or less. And so uh, those are the criteria that we use to uh, enroll patients into the SEVERE trial. Uh, in, our, in our institution and in, in our health system, uh, the majority of patients that would have qualified for the other trial, the moderate trial, uh, uh, for example, those patients that had uh, saturations above 94%, the, the vast majority of those patients were able to go home. Uh, and preliminarily, uh, very few of them appear to be returning to the hospital. And those are uh, data that we're looking at to try to identify uh, these people that don't have severe disease, uh, can, you know, can they go home? Uh, with respect to remdesivir and severe pneumonia, uh, at our institutions, we would, as rapidly as, as possible, when they made the, met these inclusion criteria, we would start them on remdesivir. And ideally, uh, the, 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 the treatment would begin uh, as soon as those criteria are met. Um, and oftentimes, those were within uh, 10 days of symptom onset. Uh, and frequently, they were usually around day five or so of symptom onset. Uh, after about day 10 of symptoms, uh, we, we can see a dramatic worsening of, of symptoms with progressive respiratory failure uh, and requirement uh, for mechanical ventilation, for example. Uh, and so what the Gilead severe study uh, appeared to show is that patients that were started uh, on treatment uh, before that 10th day of symptoms, that cohort of patients uh, had a higher likelihood of being able to be discharged to home, uh, meaning I think, you know, partly clinical success. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next we'll have Magda Sakowska from Polish TV. Magda, I'm trying to unmute you. There you are. Okay, do you hear me? Okay, thank yes. you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for doing this briefing. My name is Magda Sakowska. I'm a correspondent to Polish TV, Polsat News. Dr. Diaz, um, I have a question. Do you know or could you tell us what kind of side effects remdesivir can cause? And in your opinion, what will be first, the cure for COVID-19 or vaccine? Uh, I'm not sure that we, uh, with therapeutics, can discuss a, a cure in 100% of patients. Uh, uh, Dr. Tony Fauci uh, uh, of the uh, NIH had indicated that, that remdesivir didn't appear to be a knockout 100% drug. Uh, but it did in his hands have uh, uh, effect, uh, that it did have the ability to stop the virus, and they saw an improvement in recovery times. Uh, we have this therapeutic uh, now here, uh, and because the FDA has uh, uh, provided emergency use authorization, uh, it will become available uh, worldwide uh, very shortly, and Gilead is working with local governments to, to provide this medication to those patients most in need. Um, vaccine work often takes uh, over a year to determine its safety uh, and effectiveness. And within the U.S., there's many uh, vaccine trials that are ongoing and enrolling patients already. Uh, we're hopeful that within a year we'll have a vaccine. Uh, in the interim period, it's important to uh, find any therapies that, that we may have uh, available for treatment of COVID. Uh, and remdesivir appears to be uh, one that does have activity against the virus. And what about the uh, side effects? Yeah, so the, 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 the largest side effect that we've seen is, it has been nausea. Uh, at my center, uh, we did not have to discontinue uh, that medication uh, 
for that reason. Uh, other side effects that one can see include uh, transient rises and the liver function tests of a patient. Uh, in our experience uh, locally, uh, those rises have been relatively uh, mild uh, and and not uh, have not needed discontinuation of the drug. Uh, we also know that COVID-19 by itself also uh, can cause liver from inflammation as well. Uh, and so it's a little unclear uh, what the interplay between drug and the viruses in the liver, uh, but uh, in inflammation of the liver can also be a, a, another side effect. Uh, but the, the, the issue that, that most commonly uh, excludes patients uh, from uh, remdesivir has been uh, abnormal renal function. Uh, and we have uh, many patients who are elderly uh, that present to the hospital uh, dehydrated uh, and have uh, borderline renal function to receive the drug. Uh, and so there are quite a few patients where uh, we've enrolled them uh, and their kidney function has just barely been uh, adequate for uh, treatment with remdesivir. Uh, we've seen similar results in those patients that have received treatment. And generally speaking, we haven't seen substantial uh, increases in uh, abnormal renal function after starting uh, treatment with remdesivir, even in those patients. Uh, but that would be another concern is in patients at risk for renal disease, uh, they could potentially need to discontinue the medication due to renal, renal uh, issues. Thank you very much. Okay, next I'll call on, I'm afraid, um, please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Is it uh, Weyer Gay from China Business Network? I'm trying to unmute you. Can everyone hear me? Okay, yes, now I can. Thank you, thank you, Doctor, um, for the briefing. Uh, my question is, um, so when we talk about that in early days, when we give uh, the patient remdesivir, um, it shows um, more improvement. But uh, as far as I know, like uh, in New York City, uh, people are not admitted to um, hospital like uh, some of my friends who got uh, this COVID-19. Um, they have fever, they have a cough or but most of the time they will not be admitted to the hospital. And we also have some other reports showing that in certain period of time, the, it, the, the situation, the condition will worse suddenly. So for those patients, I'm just curious about at what stage right now or in the future, your suggestion um, patients to getting remdesivir and also because right now it uh, we have to get this uh, prescription at a hospital because it's it's in a vial it's not a tablet so i would just ask your thoughts on this thank you yeah that's a really good question uh what what we have seen in, in our uh, hospitals is that patients may present with mild symptoms initially uh, for example, no pneumonia and x-ray uh, and normal oxygen levels, but symptomatic. Uh, in the patients that are high risk, meaning those people that are age over 60 or have illnesses that are that places them at high risk for disease, uh, those patients within our health system, we've been uh, discharging them uh, with uh, pulse oximetry and telehealth monitoring. So we have uh, telehealth nurses that will uh, contact them by phone or by video. Uh, to uh, talk to them, to see how they're doing, to, to interview them, uh, and also to measure their uh, vital signs, including their oxygen saturations. Uh, the, the purpose of this is to try to detect uh, any changes early before a patient becomes ill enough to uh, warrant uh, ICU level care. So we want to detect the change uh, at the earliest stage uh, of uh, when, when someone develops what we would consider severe illness. Uh, a large majority of these patients who are discharged from the emergency department who have COVID uh, end up having mild disease. And so what we want to know is in the patients that uh, are in this category that they have, don't qualify for admission and don't qualify for remdesivir, can we find the ones that are, are going to become sick uh, and get them back into the hospital as quickly as possible. And so one way of keeping close track of our patients uh, is to monitor them actively outside the hospital with oxygen levels and, and vital signs and history taking uh, to safely bring them in as soon as we see a change in the condition that would warrant admission uh, and patient, potentially treatment with remdesivir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to switch to a different region and call on, I believe it's Nia Fote from the News 2 Brazil. 
okay? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, yes. do, uh, Dr. George Diaz. I speak a little Spanish too, but I speak Portuguese very well. So <laughs> my, my question is, okay, for example, like there's this ongoing reopening phase of some states in the United States. And so, and the fear of the COVID-19, the resurgence of this COVID-19. So with your knowledge and this new uh, treatment that you discovered, so do you think the, the mass use of this uh, redem severe drug will give assurance to the Americans that, oh, we can go back to work and at least we have a treatment that can, I don't know, help us out with that? Yeah, those are, those are good questions. Uh, I would say that uh, any medication that we use to treat an infection, whether it be to treat uh, uh, bacteria or viruses, uh, we want to make sure that these medicines are treated, used appropriately uh, okay. because widespread inappropriate use of any medicine can result in resistance uh, to that particular medication. Uh, and so uh, as the FDA has approved this medication on, on an emergency use authorization, uh, it'll be really important that we try to use this medication as appropriately as possible. And at this point, it's only been shown to have uh, some effectiveness in people that have uh, severe pneumonia. Uh, so I, I would say that we need to be very careful in how we use this medication and use it very wisely uh, because widespread inappropriate use could result in potentially the development of resistance to the antiviral, uh, as we've seen on occasion to, uh, for example, treatments for influenza. Uh, so, uh, thankfully, it appears that we do have an agent in our armamentarium against COVID, uh, but we have to be, use it very wisely. Uh, this should not be used as a crutch to uh, for patients to say, well, uh, or people to say, I can now do whatever I want because we have a treatment. Uh, no, the, the, the people of the world need to continue to follow the guidance of the infection control and public health people uh, that are advising them about social distancing because that is the most effective uh, treatment we have for COVID-19 uh, at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now we'll go to a different region. We'll call on Jahan Zayub Ali from Pakistan with RE News. Thank you so much, uh, yes. uh, yeah. so thank you, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for arranging this briefing. Um, uh, so my question is, that, is it available uh, in all of our America? I mean, in all the hospitals? And uh, is the clinical trials also going on? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's currently available uh, in the U.S. under numerous sites that are part of the clinical trials. Uh, there's also availability for through an expanded uh, uh, use program uh, promoted by Gilead, so hospitals can apply to that program. Uh, and it's now available by emergency use authorization, which means that uh, hospitals uh, will now be able to order the antiviral uh, through the normal processes of ordering any medication uh, that they would otherwise uh, bring into their pharmacy. Uh, so yes, uh, it should be available to uh, any hospital that uh, requests it. Uh, Gilead is currently working on uh, uh, working with international governments also to make available to uh, other countries that, that would want to have access to this medication as well. Uh, and I'm sure they're working on uh, ramping up supply chain to meet the, the substantial demand that may be coming. Thank you very much. We will now um, take one or two more questions in English and then we'll switch to the um, Spanish virtual pool asides. Uh, next, we have Mladen Petkov from Bulgarian National Radio. And let's see, are you unmuted? Yes. Please go ahead, Mladen. Uh, can you hear me okay? Hello. Um, you sound very far away. Okay, is this better? Um, can you speak a little louder, maybe move closer yes, to your yes, microphone? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for doing this, Dr. Diaz. And you talked about the availability in the U.S. But I want to I wanted to ask you if you can talk about the priorities, those areas that will have a priority. And also you mentioned about international cooperation and now currently Gilead working with local governments. Can you can you tell, more, tell us more about this cooperation going on? Thank you. I think the question had to do about international cooperation for access of uh, remdesivir to foreign governments. Uh, I, I can't say that I know the specifics of, of what that plan is. Uh, I, I would uh, refer you to the Gilead Media Department. Uh, they can probably uh, provide a statement as to what their plan is for distribution for worldwide use. 
Thank you. We will um, try to find that media relations email address and send it out to those of you who RSVP'd. Um, let's see, let's keep with, um, let's go to Olivia Zhang with Kaishan Media, China. Okay, go ahead, Olivia. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for doing this. And um, the question is, uh, I wonder whether you are um, paying attention to the clinical trial in China on remdesivir, which has shown that there's no significant, um, there's no significant, uh, you know, benefits to this uh, the, the the disease. And also wondering, um, you mentioned about the next uh, steps. I'm not sure. I probably you probably touch on that. I'm just wondering what's the next. Uh, focus on this uh, remdesivir trial, if you can elaborate more on that. Sure. Thank that's, you. That's a really good question about the trial in China. Uh, there was a uh, double blinded controlled study in China that uh, results were published in The Lancet uh, about a week and a half ago. Uh, that study showed no benefit to uh, remdesivir. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the study uh, could not complete enrollment of, of all the patients that were uh, recommended. I think uh, uh, one of the ways that uh, studies determine if there's a benefit is by uh, making calculations to be able to detect a difference um, in in a treatment or, or non-treatment. Uh, and so those numbers are very important to be able to find a, a, a statistical uh, difference. Uh, the, the researchers in China were not able to complete the enrollment uh, and only enrolled about half the number of patients uh, that, that was uh, recommended. Um, the, the authors in that paper uh, indicated that it could have been due to several factors. One, uh, that the the measures that were uh, in place in the region where the study was being conducted uh, were such that uh, few patients after a certain date uh, were being admitted to the hospital. Uh, and also those patients that were admitted uh, later in the study uh, when the, the numbers decreased uh, entered the hospital very late uh, and, and more sick. Uh, and so uh, they, they expressed concern about the, their finding uh, being valid because of those two factors. Uh, one, they weren't able to complete their enrollment, uh, and two, uh, they, uh, the, the patients that they were admitting uh, appeared to be sicker and had, had waited longer than, than uh, that had been expected before the study started. Uh, with respect to next steps, uh, we are currently awaiting the publication uh, of the study from Gilead looking at five versus 10 days of therapy. Uh, that Those results have not yet been published. Uh, we're awaiting the results of the, uh, the NIH trial. Uh, Dr. Fauci had alluded to some beneficial uh, effects in that study. Uh, and we're working on our uh, study uh, within our Providence St. Joseph Health System, uh, which was also looking at uh, mortality as an outcome. Uh, and we are ourselves waiting for a peer review before uh, formally announcing the rest of the results of that study. Yeah, can I just do a very quick follow-up? Yes, uh, quickly, please. Yeah, I just wondering, uh, is this trial just going to be do like separately and you're going to pay attention to, you know, the result, the research results from other countries or there is actually going to be actual cooperation on those trials with China and probably other countries too? Yeah, so the, the, um, the Gilead Severe study uh, was a multinational study involving countries from all over uh, Asia, uh, Europe, and the United States. And so that study has been actively enrolling uh, patients worldwide, and I would anticipate that further studies will, will still continue to be multinational. Okay, we'll take one final question for the English portion of our briefing. I will call on... Um, we have a, a reporter from Poland again, Marcin Rona with TV and Polish TV. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, Remdesivir uh, seems to be the first step. Uh, do you see it as a path to a more effective cure or this is as much as we can get with Remdesivir and we need to look for something else more effective if we really want to have, you know, like, uh, a miracle drug that would cure it uh, 100%. Thank you. 
my personal opinion is that remdesivir has activity against the virus uh, and that there are benefits to using the medicine that, that uh, improve the lives of patients who, who receive it. Uh, there are uh, patients where we know that present with uh, severe disease uh, or later disease where they have uh, are on a ventilator, uh, very ill, uh, and a large number of these patients will, will expire. Uh, part of that uh, disease process is uh, something called cytokine release syndrome, where the virus triggers an immune response uh, in the body uh, that uh, causes severe and rapid decompensation, uh, which is a process that um, is mediated by specific hormones in the body. Uh, there are ongoing studies now uh, with other therapeutics to try to reduce uh, the, that inflammatory cascade uh, in the body. Uh, these are a class of antibodies that target uh, specific cytokines called uh, IL-6. Uh, the, these trials are, are currently ongoing in the US, uh, and it may be that in the future, uh, in some of these very, very ill patients, there may be an additive uh, effect of using therapeutics like that. Uh, there are a number of other studies that are being looked at as well for this disease, uh, including convalescent plasma and other therapies that are also experimental. Uh, they're not quite as far along at this point uh, as remdesivir is. Uh, thankfully, it appears that we have at least uh, one therapeutic at this point uh, that, that we appear to know has benefit. Uh, and so there's going to be further data from remdesivir coming out. And over the next few months, uh, we will likely have further data on alternate therapeutics as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I want to ask Master Control and our tech people to continue the live stream and continue the recording. Um, that concludes the official part of the briefing in English. Um, if anyone did not get to ask a question, you may email any remaining questions to dcfpc at state.gov, and we will forward those to uh, Dr. Diaz. Um, for those who would like to join the Spanish language, uh, we're calling them virtual pull asides. Please stay after the um, others leave the meeting. All others may leave the meeting to disconnect. A transcript of the official briefing in English will hopefully be ready this afternoon or tomorrow morning. And the video and transcript will be posted on the Foreign Press Center website as usual. We will not have a transcript of the Spanish portion, um, but we will post the video on our website. Um, so if I could, we have a number of people who have requested um, to ask questions. Y vamos a empezar ahora con Beatriz Pascual de FA España. Oh, I accidentally muted you. Okay, go ahead, Beatriz. De acuerdo. Hola, gracias. Eh, quería preguntarle, doctor, la FDA, eh, the Food and Drug Administration, ha autorizado el uso del RD, de este medicamento también en niños. Eh, ¿Han observado algún tipo de diferencia en el tratamiento de niños? Eh, si en su ensayo clínico también han tratado niños, si nos puede explicar un poco eso. Gracias. No, hasta ahora no hemos tratado este medicamento en niños. Uh, para el estudio que hicimos nosotros, uh, el paciente tenía que tener 18 años o, o más. Uh, entonces, para nosotros no hemos tenido pacientes que hemos usado este medicamento en, en jóvenes o niños. Ok, ya. Yeah. Eh, ok, vamos a seguir con Gustavo Alegre de NTN24, yo creo, de Colombia, ¿verdad? Bueno, eh, Canal Internacional de Noticias. Okay. Y, y estamos en Estados Unidos. Doctor, muchas gracias por atendernos. Eh, un gusto escucharle y aprender. Quería preguntarle por eh, si ha tenido una experiencia particular con la comunidad latina. Algunos pa estados han recogido información desagregada que muestra que los latinos, junto con los afroamericanos, son las comunidades que han sido más afectadas por la COVID-19. Quería saber si ha tenido eh, una experiencia particular con el uso del Rendesivir con los latinos particularmente y uh, si tiene algún comentario en el trato con la comunidad latina uh, que los expertos, y usted nos lo puede confirmar, coinciden en destacar que no se trata de una cuestión del de, eh, origen de las personas, sino por el tipo de trabajo que hacen. Gracias. Sí, eh, en mi estado hemos visto esto también, que, que gente de origen latina uh, ha tenido más casos de COVID-19 que, que la población en general. 
uh, en estos pacientes uh, no estamos seguros todavía por qué ellos en números más grandes han uh, tenido que ser internados en el hospital y también han muerto. Pero en, 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 el, en el estudio que estamos haciendo nosotros, nosotros en Providence hemos visto que, que casi uh, un, un número grande de nuestros pacientes son de gente latina y se espera que sea por razones de cómo viven, uh, que muchos de ellos viven en casas con, con gente de hijos, niños, quizás abuelos. Y, y, y el virus que es posible que se contagie más fácil en una comunidad así que está donde diferentes generaciones de, de personas viven en la misma casa. Y, y también es posible que el tipo de trabajo uh, y por recursos bajos, uh, estas personas no han podido uh, mantener o observar la, la distancia social por razones económicas. Y yo creo que es, esas cosas económicas uh, son unas razones más grandes que, que el, el origen de la persona de, 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 de ser más afectado con este virus. Ok, gracias. Y seguimos ahora con Alejandra Arredondo de Voice of America. Oh, okay. ¿Me oyes? ¿Me oyen? Hola. Sí, muchas, escuchamos. Muchas gracias por hacer esta esta conferencia, eh, una pre mi pregunta es, ¿qué tanto depende la efectividad de este medicamento de que haya una gran cantidad de pruebas en la población? Porque usted antes había dicho que eh, las personas, eh, es más efectivo cuando se usa al principio de, del contagio, ¿no? Entonces, eh, ¿depende mucho o poco eh, la efectividad del medicamento de que haya gran parte de pruebas en la población? Muchas gracias. Es una buena pregunta porque al comienzo del brote aquí en Estados Unidos, nosotros también teníamos dificultad en obtener los exámenes en una forma rápida para tener los resultados de las muestras. Y, y, y esto creo que al comienzo lo hizo un poco más difícil para nosotros empezar a poner pacientes en el estudio clínico porque si tomaba tres o cuatro días para recibir los resultados, no podíamos administrar Rondesivir. Y, y en esos casos yo creo que uh, empezarlo un poco más tarde quizás tuvo un efecto. Uh, por eso yo creo que es, es muy importante, es bien importante uh, saber eh, qué tipo de infección tiene una persona, porque en estos casos uh, se debe requerir que una persona que, que pensamos que tenga COVID, podamos hacer la muestra en una forma rápida para tener el diagnóstico y para empezar el tratamiento preparado lo más rápido que se pueda. Uh, por eso es, es muy importante uh, para que países tengan acceso a, a, a las muestras para poder uh, determinar qué pacientes tienen COVID y, y cuáles no. Porque no todos los pacientes que vienen con esos síntomas tienen COVID. Algunas personas pueden tener un diferente virus o una neumonía bacterial o algo diferente. Y queremos usar este recurso de este medicamento de una forma apropiada en pacientes que, que sabemos que tienen COVID y que, y que tienen neumonía. Uh, por eso es muy, muy importante uh, tener acceso a las muestras uh, para hacerlo. Ok, gracias. Uh, seguimos que con Pablo Guimón del país, <ríe> de El País, España. Ok. I think I'm muting and people Ahora. are unmuting. Ok. Ahora me oye? Sí, sí. Bueno, eh, muchísimas gracias, doctor, por, por, por esta oportunidad. Y quería preguntarle una pregunta un poco, un poco general. Eh, ha dicho que ha notado algún, algún, algún cambio también en la, en, en, en la, mort en la mortandad, ¿no? que, que se reduce un poco. Quería saber si nos podía explicar un poco más eso y, si, y también en qué medida, eh, porque bueno, en, en lo que han visto hasta ahora es en pacientes, por lo menos en el primer caso, muy jóvenes o bastante jóvenes, administrando el fármaco muy pronto, que se conseguía una reducción de cuatro días, digamos, en el, en el tiempo de, en, la, en, en, en el alta de la hospitalización. ¿Y eso qué puede significar para la red de, de, de bueno, o sea, ¿qué, qué mejora sustancial puede significar? ¿no? O sea, ¿qué, ¿Cuál es esa mejora que, que, que veríamos? Y, y por último quería preguntarle simplemente si, si nos puede aclarar si, si tiene usted alguna, alguna relación contractual con Gilead o, o, o alguna... Sí, claro. So, yo soy un investigador con Gilead. Uh, mi, mis hospitales de Providence, uh, tenemos 14 hospitales que hemos participado en ese estudio uh, de este medicamento. Um, y, uh, al respecto de la mortalidad, uh, el, el estudio del, del, del NIH 
uh, que el doctor Tony Fauci había comentado que uh, ellos piensan que es posible que, tenga, que ellos también uh, vean una mejoranza de, de mortalidad. En nuestro estudio de Providence, lo cual todavía no hemos publicado, también parece que nosotros también estamos viendo, uh, viendo que los pacientes que reciben este medicamento tienen, uh, mueren menos que pacientes que no lo reciben. Esos estudios estamos eh, en la fase primaria de, de, de investigación y esperamos ojalá mandarlo para publicación uh, pronto. Al respecto al tratamiento ahora, lo que sabemos es de que en los estudios que han salido hasta ahora, que pacientes que reciben el medicamento uh, hasta ahora uh, tienen un tiempo para recuperarse más rápido uh, si reciben el medicamento. Y digamos que una persona quizás que, que estuviera en hospital a 15 días, si recibe el medicamento, eso se reduce a, a 11 días. Y también en los pacientes que, que, que reciben el medicamento uh, temprano, lo, o sea, antes de, de terminar 10 días de síntomas, uh, el, uh, el 62% de ellos pueden volver a casa, uh, a comparado al 49% de pacientes que, que se recuperan y vuelven a casa si empiezan el medicamento después de 10 días de síntomas. Lo que aprendemos de este, esto es de que es muy posible que el tratamiento temprano, cuando una persona desarrolla neumonía, es el tiempo optimal para, para dar este medicamento. Okay. Muchas gracias. Eh, vamos con uh, Cristina Olea, próximamente con TVE, Televisión uh, de España. Cristina, ¿escucha? Hola, ¿me escuchan ya? Sí. sí. Vale, pues me gustaría, eh, muchísimas gracias doctor, me gustaría pedirle que nos repitiera algunas cosas que ya ha contado usted en inglés, pero me gustaría que las volviera a contar en español si es posible. Eh, para empezar, me gustaría eh, como médico que nos relatara eh, qué observó en esos primeros pacientes con COVID-19 y qué cambios observó directamente en ellos al administrarles este fármaco. Y también me gustaría si nos pudiera decir como médico qué impresión tiene sobre cuándo podría haber una vacuna disponible y qué les aconsejaría mientras no la hay a los estadounidenses, ahora que están volviendo a trabajar y en muchos sitios están reabriendo negocios, que, que les aconsejaría que hicieran. Okay. Uh, gracias. Um, sobre la primera pregunta que fue uh, sobre uh, mis observaciones con los primeros pacientes que recibieron Remdesivir, uh, es difícil saber exactamente Uh, por cada paciente como uh, cuál es el resultado, ¿no? Porque se requiere un estudio clínico para saber con certidumbre cuál es el efecto. Pero lo que puedo decir es de que los pacientes que hemos dado este medicamento en, es, en mi, so, mi hospital uh, no hemos visto muchos efectos malos de este medicamento. Uh, casi nunca hemos tenido que parar el medicamento por cualquier razón de náusea o de efectos al hígado o riñones. Uh, la mayor parte, digamos, más del 95% de pacientes no han tenido que parar el medicamento por cualquier razón. Um, al respecto al medicamento, uh, uh, como se relaciona a la vacuna, uh, esperamos que la vacuna salga, pero salga, normalmente se demora más o menos un año para, para poder evaluar una vacuna, para asegurarnos que es una vacuna que no tiene peligro uh, y también que sea efectivo. Durante este tiempo de, de los estudios de vacuna, la única forma de, que tenemos para tratar esta infección es a través de, de un medicamento, un, un, una medicina. Uh, y en esta época ahora parece que ten, este medicamento tiene alguna efectividad contra el virus. Uh, por ahora, uh, hay muchos países o estados en Estados Unidos que están empezando a abrir sus economías. Eso se tiene que hacer a través de, de, del gobierno del estado, con el gobernador y, y con, el, con el, el Consejo de Salud Pública. Uh, porque en mi estado, por ejemplo, en el área que está, donde está Seattle, uh, esta comunidad solamente tiene el 2% de anticuerpos positivos en, en la población, lo cual me dice de que hemos tenido bastantes pacientes en el hospital 
uh, en mi área, pero solamente hasta ahora el 2% ha tenido la infección. Uh, y eso nos preocupa bastante por uh, un, un segundo brote si, si la economía se abre muy rápido. Muchas gracias. Ok, uh, vamos a otra región otra vez con Alina Dieste de ASP, Francia. Sí. Uh, yes. Uh, buenas tardes. Muchas buenas. gracias. Muchas gracias por, por esta oportunidad. Me gustaría preguntarle al doctor, eh, primero que nada, si esta es una medicación, un medicamento caro. Este, yo sé que por lo que usted explicó, están haciendo los acuerdos para una distribución internacional pero me gustaría saber si de base es un medicamento caro que pueda hacer pensar que va a ser difícil que todo el mundo acceda. Y la siguiente pregunta es usted, como doctor, que ha tratado el primer paciente eh, infectado con este virus en Estados Unidos, ¿qué es lo que más le preocupa viendo el grado de este, bueno, mortalidad que ha tenido esta enfermedad? ¿Cuál es su mayor preocupación como médico? Uh, primeramente, el costo, yo no sé, uh, eso lo dirigía a, a la compañía Gilead. Uh, ellos quizás pueden dar un estimado de cuánto va a costar el medicamento. Uh, ese número yo no sé. Uh, lo que me preocupa a mí es de que uh, ahora uh, uh, este virus ha hecho, uh, ha tenido un efecto muy grande sobre las economías del mundo uh, y, y es difícil mantener la distancia social. Y los que, lo que me preocupa a mí es de que cuando es, eh, la economía se empiece a abrir de nuevo, vamos a ver un, un segundo brote que sea quizás hasta tan grande como el primero. Y el primero fue muy difícil para nosotros y para todo el mundo. Uh, y, 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 y eso más que nada me preocupa que no sé si vamos a tener los recursos para poder manejar un uh, segundo, segundo brote o segunda fase de esta infección. Yes. Ok, y tenemos uno o dos más. Eh, Bricio Segovia de Voice of America Televisión. Sí, eh, hola, gracias por esta oportunidad. Eh, hola, Bricio. Hola, qué bueno verte. Eh, una pregunta sobre cuánto se prevé, cuánto tiempo se prevé que tarde eh, esta fase de uso de emergencia y podamos pasar a una fase más generalizada del medicamento. Dicho de otra manera, ¿cuánto puede extenderse esta fase y cuándo podríamos tener un medicamento aprobado para tratar el COVID-19, al menos teniendo en cuenta los tiempos habituales con este tipo de, 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 de ensayos clínicos? Y una segunda pregunta sería si me pudiera resumir los efectos secundarios que han observado hasta el momento. Gracias. Um... El tiempo desde ahora hasta que eh, el FDA apruebe la medi el medicamento es un poco desconocido, pero uh, el FDA ha dado este, esta alteración de emergencia por los datos que salieron de dos estudios que todavía no han sido publicados en, en un jornal uh, médico. Uh, espero que después de más análisis, uh, especialmente a, 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 a relación de mortalidad, uh, si eso sale que... que Definitivamente hay, hay un beneficio eh, en mortalidad que, que la FDA pueda uh, autorizar ese medicamento para uso general. Um, eh, lamentablemente, uh, eh, esperábamos mucho de la, de, del estudio de China porque era un estudio donde se usaba el placebo también y, y esperábamos tener esos datos para decir más definitivamente que este medicamento es efectivo. En esa área no pudieron completar el número de pacientes que tenían que tener el estudio para, para poder detectar la diferencia. Y ahora, los estudios que han seguido, um, no se va a ser posible usar placebo, porque sabemos que hay un nivel de actividad o efectividad con este medicamento hasta ahora. Y los estudios que se, normalmente se hacen para establecer que, que un medicamento es efectivo, 
usando placebo, no creo que se van a poder hacer de nuevo. Entonces, lo que va a pasar es vamos a tener más estudios o más datos científicos que van a ser estudios que, que nos digan quizás que hay un beneficio a mortalidad, pero no van a ser estudios perfectos como queríamos que, que sean con, con un, un brazo de placebo. Um, y no me acuerdo la segunda pregunta, disculpa. La segunda pregunta era sobre eh, los efectos secundarios del medicamento. Muchas gracias. Uh, menos mal, en nuestras manos no hemos visto muchos uh, efectos secundarios. Uh, el, el más grande es náusea. Uh, eso normalmente se puede manejar con otros medicamentos de antináusea. Uh, también se puede ver cambios en, en los riñones y, y, y exámenes de hígado. Uh, pero para nosotros no hemos tenido que parar el medicamento por esa razón. Aunque hay gente uh, de, de edad avanzada que quizás vienen con los riñones que no están completamente no, normal y, y con uh, líquido por suero se, se pueden mejorar si están deshidratados. Y, 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 pero de todas maneras, por, por su edad, uh, sus riñones están apenas al nivel para poder empezar este medicamento. Y en pocos casos hemos tenido que parar el medicamento porque ha, 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 ha habido un efecto pequeño, pero suficiente para tener que parar el medicamento por razones de riñones. Pero casi siempre es una persona anciana. Gracias. Ok, tenemos uh, también Víctor Sancho desde México y vamos a ver si él tiene una pregunta. Quería preguntar, pero no um, levantó su mano. Uh, Víctor. Víctor. Ok, él no contesta. Um, oh, Víctor. Ok, no. Ok, uh, muchas gracias. Eso um, concluye entonces el briefing uh, de hoy, los virtual pull asides. Um, so, thank you all for participating. Gustavo? I'm sorry, Cheryl. I, I just, I'm sorry. I just came back to see whether Dr. Diaz has a couple more minutes for the China clinical trial question. Um, actually, we had a request for a one-on-one -on -one that he has agreed to do ah. with um, NTN okay. 24. Gustavo, if you're still there. And I'd like to ask um, all others to leave the room. And um, uh, is that Olivia? Yeah. Or maybe okay. If you want to send us the question, we'll forward it to him. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. So Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Gustavo, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, doctor. Um, I was wondering if we can call you uh, from our studio to record a, a five-minute interview. Uh, I would defer that to Mark Gross, our, our national communications director. Uh, he, he's managing that, uh, that work. OMG. <laughs> <laughs> he's, that um, that he means? said that there's a few minutes, so let me just... Um, He's unmuted and he can tell you how to contact them. Yeah, I'm, uh, if you can hear me, I'm fine with that. Um, can you hear me okay, Cheryl? Can you speak yeah. up a little? Yeah, Mark, how are you doing? Um, I'm a reporter. I work for the International News Channel, NTN24. Uh, we broadcast our signal through the uh, uh, U.S. and the Americas. And uh, I, I, I was interested in having a, a short interview in Spanish trying to summarize what we have uh, talked in this uh, conference call through the doctor in Spanish to be aired tonight. Um, if possible, we can record the interview uh, in the next five, 10 minutes, if possible. Yeah, I'll email you my email address, or I'll chat uh, you my email address and we can set it up. Okay, just one, one question. Do you think it could be today? because we are planning our show tomorrow uh, for tonight. And I was wondering if we can count on this uh, interview or not. Yes, that, we can do that today. Oh. I think if um, just, he's gonna send you a chat via sure. Zoom, Gustav. Okay. Uh, with his email address. Uh, Mark, you can send that privately. You can select which um, journalist or you can send it to everybody. Yeah. 
actually don't send it to everybody because it'll go up on the live stream. I already have the email. Ah, uh, okay, okay. That I already sense. have the email. Okay, so that concludes our activities for today. Carol, thank Diaz. you very much. That was We'd very like, useful. Thank you. We'd like to thank you again, Dr. Diaz, for your time. This was wonderful. Mark, thank you so much for setting this up. And to all of the journalists who joined, muchas gracias. Eh, y uh, hasta luego. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so much. We'll leave the meeting now. Hey.